Good morning and welcome on this glorious spring morning. Um, you may notice by our colors that we are very excited about spring. We are shining this morning and it seems to have had some influence on the weather, so yay us. My name is Karen Mills and I have the pleasure of being your service leader this morning along with my co-conductor Gordon Ritchie and Corey Alice. I'd like to welcome you all this morning and before we get into our service proper we have lots of announcements this morning. Um, I have one to begin with. The service um, and the celebration of life for Bryce Missile will be on April 23rd at 2 p.m. Marg Roach is organizing the lunch um, but needs a lot of help and so if you can help with setup, serving or cleanup, please see her today. Um, and again, that's for April 23rd at 2 p.m. All right, I know we have a special announcement coming in from Keeler Hall. All right, good morning, good morning, everyone. So after two year hiatus, our Mammoth Grass Sale is scheduled for Saturday, Friday and Saturday, May 13th and 14th. Oh yes, I could. <laughs> this is our main fundraiser. And did you know that our garage sales have raised over a million dollars for this church? Wow. Yes, there you go. It took, a, it took a few years, but we did it. <laughs> but more importantly, it's a way for us to work together for a common purpose and also to uh, invite the community back to our church. And think of all the reusing that we're doing to sa help save the planet. We know that most of you have been saving up all your treasures and if you've more few short weeks, you can bring them Sunday, May 1st, not before, please. We will have a table set up and labeled and we'll ask you to uh, put your items empty your own boxes as much as possible because that will really help a lot. I have a schedule here for uh, signing up to help. Uh, I know that you're, I know a couple of people have even taken days off work to come and help work. So if you've got holidays that you know are begging, well, take them off then. We, two weeks of uh, setting up and the garage sale and clearing up. And um, so Karen, um, Susan and I have things for sale now, <laughs> so we can start any time. So see us after the service. I just I have to add that Jan is. Those are all Jan's purses. These are all. <laughs> these are all my earrings. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Reverend Rosemary Morrison, and um, I have an announcement regarding a service this afternoon at 1 o'clock here. The Edmonton Interfaith Service is going to be holding uh, interfaith prayers for peace and for those lost in war. Pray for their souls. So I'll be setting that up for the Interfaith Service for 1 o'clock this afternoon. And also, I was noticing... Um, we might want to do, I'll put a garage, uh, garbage can outside if we could just, there's quite a bit of garbage in the parking lot. If we could just, everybody just throw a piece of garbage out. Uh, CBC will actually be here this afternoon. They're going to be here and taking some pictures and televising. So it would be good if we s just got rid of some of the garbage before they came with the cameras. <laughs> um, it was all hidden under the snow. Who knew? Nobody's fault. Okay, so one o'clock this afternoon, sorry for the notice, it just happened like that. It, there was an email flurry and poof, before you knew it, there was a service happening this afternoon here in this sanctuary that everyone is invited to. Uh, if you wish to be here, um, it will not be Zoomed. It's not going to be going online at all. It'll just be uh, a service for in, in sanctuary. Thank you. Any other announcements? No. All 
Right. Well, the Unitarian Universalist faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of our world community. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here today. We respectfully acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional gathering place for diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Soto, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories and languages and cultures continue to enrich our vibrant community. We also recognize that everyone has a role to play in today's in building community, and we can do so by cherishing old friendships and opening our circle to welcome newcomers. We give thanks to those who work on our behalf to make this community what it is. And we acknowledge our volunteers, so many behind the scenes and up front who help this service run so smoothly today. We ask that you take a moment now to silence anything that beeps, tweets, whistles, um, and may uh, take away from our time of worship together. We're glad that you've joined us this morning, and we hope you find something in this service that nourishes your spirit and helps you find and keep your balance through the week. We'll now open our service with a prelude. Everything Begins on the Verge of Awareness by George Kimmick Beach. Everything begins on the verge of, aware of awareness. The dawn is not, and then is. Sleep is, and then is not. In between is the awakening. The passage of thin light between breaks open the day. The passage of thin sound between flows into the day. Too soon the numbing rumble of traffic swells. The day glares. 
Let the soft haze hang again across the row of morning. Wait upon the narrow moment, the first awareness of being in between. Live days and seasons on the thin edge of dawn in praise that every single thing begins now. Our uh, child of slider this morning is going to be Elaine Maynard. Hi, Elaine. Good morning. It's time. It's time, my dear. It's time. <laughs> Come We Now Out of the Darkness by Annie Forster. Come we now out of the darkness of our unknowing and the dusk of our dreaming. Come we now from far places. Come we now into the twilight of our awakening and the reflection of our gathering. Come we now all together. We bring unilluminated our dark caves of doubting. We seek and bedazzled the clear light of understanding. May the sparks of our joining kindle our resolve, brighten our spirits, reflect our love, and unshadow our days. Come we now enter the dawning. I'll invite you now to sing One Flame, which is perhaps a new hymn for you. It's the printed page that was stuck in your hymnals. It's also going to be projected on the screen. Uh, unbeknownst to you, you have heard it as the prelude. So it will be a little bit familiar for you. Um, but please join in with us as we sing it together now, and it will be our hymn of the month.
Our next reading is O Deep Mystery of Lives by Sheldon W. Bennett. O deep mystery of our lives, voices in our hearts and lights in our minds, in the joyful freedom of our fellowship, we are here together as adventurers, called forth in spirit, individuals moving, yearning, questing, pushing the limits of our lives outwards to what is more loving and just, more beautiful and true. Here in this meeting house, this place made holy by memories, the aspirations, the purposes and ideals of those before us, we would be inspired by their example. These were women and men of vision. These were people of spirit. We here today are also people of spirit. We too are struck in awe before the great mystery of the cosmos. We too are powerfully moved by a deep concern for our world and our care for one another. The spirit moves also in us as a free religious community, joined in a common covenant of aspiration, commitment, and hope. May ours be a faith that is more than just beautiful words and high ideals. May ours be a faith of vitality and commitment a faith that burns in our hearts and blazes in our minds. May ours be a faith that shines to the world as the light of deeds and the witness of actions. O source and spirit of our lives, may we respond boldly to your call for adventure, for justice, for love, and for joy. Amen. Thank you, Jeff. Our next hymn is number 345. With joy we claim the growing light. Uh, the text will be coming up on the screen behind me as well as on your computers. For those of you who are with us online, we expect that you are singing lustily at home as we are here in the sanctuary. Please rise as you are willing and able as we join in singing hymn number 345. community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. One of the privileges of our free church tradition is to provide all of the financial support for our many ministries from among ourselves. Generosity, therefore, is one of the spiritual values we recognize as central to our personal and institutional well-being. In addition to supporting this church community, we also make a monthly commitment beyond our walls. One half of the unidentified cash received is given to an out, uh, outside organization. Some are local, some national, some international. For the month of April, we are sharing our abundance with the Unitarian Universalist United Nations Office. We thank you for your generosity and your support. With our time, our talents, and our money, we support the work of the community and the Unitarian universalist tradition. I invite you to sing with me from You I Receive.
When I was looking for a message to share this morning, what I landed on is really not what I started looking for. Um, I had spring in mind and I was thinking of something exuberant and springy and shiny and as I got reading into the readings and just thinking more about the world and the conversations that I've been having in the last month, um, shine certainly was a theme but it came through as how do we shine as people of faith? How do we shine as a community who says that we respect the inherent worth and dignity of every person when, gosh, that seems so hard to do sometimes and things are more polarized and it seems that we're being drawn to be separate and black or white and not the nuanced human beings that we all know that we are. And so the message that I well, that kind of landed in my lap, actually, while I wasn't looking for it, is, is a bit different than what we normally share. It's by UU Minister Scott Alexander, who is someone that I have quoted often and really, really like. But he delves into our history as Unitarian Universalists, and most importantly as Universalists, to say how we actually only need to look back to our own history to answer some of the questions that we have today. And I think the unfortunate irony of this message is that he wrote it in 1994, and I think it's every bit as relevant today as it was then. So hopefully we can hear it again, and maybe it changes in the next 20 years. And it's called Answering the Religious Right with the big heart of universalism. As must be obvious to every one of you, these are times of great tension and conflict in America. And I will say it's American-based. I just substitute North American in my mind, and it seems to work. Much of this turmoil is focused on what many observers have called the culture wars, the very vocal and visible battles that are occurring on many fronts to determine whose values, principles, beliefs, and perspectives will determine the shape of our American life. In particular, over the last several years, religious and cultural conservatives have been waging a fierce battle against what they perceive to be the evils of liberalism, including the availability of abortion and sex education, the affirmation and protection of gay, lesbian, and bisexual persons, and the cultural inclusion of minorities and women by means of multiculturalism and feminism, to name a few. And that so struck me as I was thinking this was written in 1994, and then looking at what's happening in Florida right now and in the southern states with the anti-abortion bills, it's unbelievably relevant. Fundamentalist Christians and others are passionately convinced that there's been a dangerous erosion of old standards of American life, a dangerous shift away from the assumptions and ideas that they believe built and sustained the nation. I believe it's crucial that we Unitarian Universalists not sit on the sidelines of these culture wars. As religious people with a good and decent vision for humans and society, we must speak up and stand up for our values and beliefs. Speak up and stand up for the principles that give our religion its large heart and enduring beauty. The cultural and religious struggle we now are in may seem like a brand new thing to many of you, but nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, 200 years ago, Universalism arose in just such a time of deep social conflict. Let us, as we struggle to gain perspective on these conflicted times and how we as a religious people should respond, begin back at the beginning. North American Universalism, like its spiritual sister, North American Unitarianism, began as a radical and optimistic Christian heresy in response to the grim doctrines of the 18th century Calvinist Puritanism. The story of how and why universalism took root in North America can perhaps be clearly told by contrasting two messages of two of the greatest preachers of the day, 
Jonathan Edwards, and Hosea Ballou. Jonathan Edwards was a Puritan's Puritan. He was the most renowned preacher of what was called the Great Awakening, an early version of a born-again Christian fundamentalist revival that occurred in the late 1700s. So really what we're seeing, not new at all. He was an athletic and charismatic man who had the power and predilection during his preaching to bring whole congregations to fearful wailing as he described the misery and damnation they deserved and would receive in hell at the hands of an angry God. Sometimes in the pulpit he would rip off his robes and tear his linen shirt to shreds in self-abasing frenzy of disgust. Listening to a portion of one of his most famous sermons where he tells listeners that they are sinners in the hands of an angry God. Here's a quote from it. The world of misery, the lake of burning brimstone is extended abroad under you. Hell's gaping mouth is wide open and you have nothing to stand upon or take hold of. It is only the power and the mere pleasure of God that holds you up. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or a loathsome insect over the fire, abhors you. You have nothing to lay hold of to save yourself. There is nothing that you have ever done, nothing that you can do to induce God to spare you one moment. And on another happy occasion, Edwards told the browbeaten folks in the pews that whenever God catches the scent of humanity, the human smell is so foul and putrid that it causes God to flare his nostrils in disgust. <laughs> Cheerful stuff, this 18th century Puritanism. But this was the soul and substance of the predominant Calvinist theory and theology of the day. God is a distant, angry, and stern judge. Humanity, a fallen and sinful beast, and most men, women, and children doomed to hell and eternal damnation and misery for their wickedness. But it was over this dark and forbidding spiritual landscape that blew the fresh and warm breezes of universalism, a theology of love, reconciliation, and hope. The early universalists in direct spiritual contradiction to uh, Puritanism's gloomy gospel simply proclaimed the essential qualities of God were not wrath, disgust, and judgment, but goodness, mercy, and love. The heartfelt good news of universalism was that by God's grace and power, all of God's children, every man, woman, child, regardless of station or personality, weakness or wickedness, would ultimately be saved, welcomed back by an embracing and understanding creator. Universalism's lifeblood was the spiritual insistence that the evil and pain we see in our world need not be permanent. The early universalists dreamed of a larger hope than sin-saturated Puritanism and passionately believed the natural inclination of God humanity, indeed creation itself, is toward the good. The American people, hungry for hopeful, positive-oriented religion, flocked to universalist churches. At one time in the 1840s, universalism was the sixth largest faith in America. The greatest universalist theologian and, theologian and preacher of the day was the Reverend Hosea Ballou every bit the orator of his great awakening counterpart, Ballou used to hold his large congregation spellbound as he gently and joyfully proclaimed this gospel of universal salvation. On one occasion, he was preaching in Boston when a rock sailed through the window and landed right near him. And remember, I told you that there was a battle on for the souls. Without missing a beat, this universalist evangelist picked up a large stone and said, this argument is solid and weighty, but it is neither reasonable or convincing. <laughs> then he put the rock aside and added, not all the stones in Boston, except those that stop my breath, shall shut my mouth. Ballou and the other early American universalists bravely preached a gospel of inclusion, 
reconciliation, and hope right in the face of Calvinist negativity, gospel that unashamedly affirmed the oneness and worth of all people. Now, when I first studied 18th and 19th century universalist thought during my years at Star King Seminary in Berkeley, I was profoundly taken by this bold and positive faith position, says Scott Alexander. What captured my spiritual attention was the large and embracing spirit of universalism, the big and beautiful heart of universalism, the deep and compassionate conviction our universalist forebears had in the basic, deep down, unquenchable goodness of creation, human society, and all people. In those days, I went as far as describing myself as a universalist Unitarian, not only because I was raised in a universalist church, but also by way of affirming my interest in and allegiance to the universalist principles of inclusion, optimism, compassion, and hope. During my final year in seminary, I decided to do a chapel for the faculty and students at the school, at which time I planned to expound on this pure and lovely gospel of universal human affirmation. God, however, had a surprise for me. The morning the chapel was to happen, I arose early, poured over my powerful and polemically precise text, I was privately proud in advance of the depth and passion with which I grasped the essence of my universalist heritage. As I walked the mile or so up the hill from my home to the school, my head was down as I silently rehearsed to myself all of the beautiful phrases I had crafted to make my sermon on universalism come alive. As I approached a busy intersection, I happened to glance up and suddenly saw an incredibly large woman sitting on a bench waiting for the bus. Now, I've always had a personal obsession with my health and my own weight, and that's why I run marathons. And in those years, I was quite prejudiced and opinionated about people who weighed more than what I thought they should. Anyway, before I could censor the unkind, judgmental thought, I blurted out to myself, oh dear God, look at that gross woman. She must weigh 400 pounds. How could anyone ever let themselves get like that? And who could ever love her? At that moment, as if it were a bolt of spiritual lightning aimed right at me, the skinny little guy sitting next to her on the bus stop bench looked lovingly into her eyes, leaned over, and gave her the most gentle, loving kiss I have ever seen one human being bestow on another. I was stunned and ashamed. And while I was still reeling from the jarring disparity between my petty and unkind judgment and his pure and simple love, a voice came out of the whirlwind and said to me, and me alone, don't you get it, you dope? Here you are, at this very moment, going up the hill to preach your clever little sermon on God's love and universal salvation for every human person, and all you can do is sneer at someone you deem unworthy and unbeautiful. Don't you understand that in the eyes of all that is sacred and beautiful and holy and true in this creation, she is as utterly lovely and beautiful as human beings get. Don't you get it? If the pleasures and prerogatives, graces and goodnesses of this creation are made for you, and you certainly claim them as your natural birthright, then they are made for her too. And you call yourself a universalist. <sighs> well, let me tell you, I was as startled as I was chastened. In that moment of pure and precious spiritual revelation, a spirit of holiness I can only call God spoke to me with heart-numbing clarity, and I finally began to understand universalism viscerally, deep in my bones. What it means to be a universalist, a real universalist, in more than name only, is to have a heart that seeks and sees at every human turn, the natural worth and preciousness of people, all people, especially those very different from oneself. 
In an instant, I understood what a wild and welcoming doctrine our universalist forebears bequeath to us. And that doctrine can be summed up in stark simplicity. There is a place set in this creation for every last person. A precious, safe place has been set for each and every one of us, period. And it is our human job to respect, protect, and nurture the well-being of all God's diverse and curious children. The early, early universalists said, pure and simple, that every human being no matter how strange or flawed or unlovable or broken or weird they seem to you, is to be protected, cherished, welcomed, and loved. Now this is not an easy faith to have in these times. Our time, I need not point out, has so much human violence, cruelty, and degradation. Just open the daily newspaper if you need evidence. Wars, Civil wars, genocide, terrorism, the manifestations of our human depravity are nearly endless. This is not an easy time to believe in the worth and redeemability of all persons. But universalism, you see, universalism then and now is not a naive and foolish bluebird faith, one that cannot see human wickedness, foible, or sin. It is rather a tenacious faith. Universalism is a promise to theologically hang in there with the complexities and cruelties of the human enterprise. It's the promise not to give up on people, but to keep struggling in our broken world for the improvement and inclusion of all. Even those ones you might naturally despise, reject, condemn, or judge. They simply refuse to give up on people. Our universalist forebears saw in humanity oneness and worth more than separateness and sin. But as everyone in this room is no doubt painfully aware, many in our culture do not see things that way. Just as in 1793, when the Puritans and Universalists were theologically battling in the public square for the hearts and minds of the American people, once again today there's a struggle for the right. The religious right, who are very vocal, very well funded, and very well organized, are preaching the same negative and judgmental human message that Jonathan Edwards preached 200 years ago. The theological and social message of the religious right is exactly the opposite of universalism's tenacious acceptance of every human person. We ignore a modern day Jonathan Edwards and his angry, narrow, and hateful religious vision at our own peril. I believe with all my heart and soul that in this time of culture wars, we must answer the religious right. We must answer them pure and simple with the truth that is universalism. Universalism, that big-hearted faith that sees the oneness and wonderfulness of all people everywhere, even in all their diversity and difficulty, is good and true. Universalism is a sound and saving vision for the human family that can help us create a livable world for all. That's why we must not hide the light of our faith under some bushel of meek and mild politeness while the and remember, this is 1994, while the Jerry Falwells of this world preach their divisive, fearful, exclusionary poison to millions. We must boldly and unashamedly share our good news that every man, woman, and child of this creation, be they young or old, black or white, rich or poor, gay or straight, is a child of God, a valuable creature fashioned out of high and holy stuff, for whom a place at life's table has been set. Wherever we are, however we find ourselves stationed in life, we must share that faith, tell that truth, live that ethic, and dare that dream. John Murray, the man who is credited with bringing universalism to America, put it this way, 
you possess only a small light, but uncover it, let it shine, use it in order to bring more light and understanding to the hearts and minds of men and women. Give them not hell, but hope and courage. We must unashamedly stand up in this culture and without arrogance and vitriol, and even perhaps with an appreciation for the integrity and thoughtfulness of many evangelical Christians, give voice to our theological beliefs and spiritual perspectives, just as our optimistic and unashamed universalist forebears did. We must be brave and forthright messengers for their larger hope for the whole of the human family. We must speak and live and share the generous heart of universalism. The bottom line is, like it or not, we must be evangelists. Unashamed evangelists willing to speak up for the kind of generous truth that is universalism. Now I realize the word evangelist may carry extremely negative connotations for many of you. Most of uh, most who call themselves Unitarian Universalists probably think of evangelists as pushy, arrogant, obnoxious zealots who sell religion door to door. But did it ever occur to you that the only reason you think so poorly of evangelists is that next to nobody who thinks or feels like you has ever engaged in the process of publicly sharing their faith? Unitarian Universalists are notoriously spiritually silent. Because we demand to think for ourselves, are respectful of human difference, and don't appreciate it when someone else tries to ram their beliefs down our throats, we tend to shy away from even polite and respectfully sharing with others what it is we believe. I know it's hard for some of us to talk back to fundamentalism by talking up our own faith, but I passionately believe we cannot afford such a self-imposed silence in dangerous and divisive times such as these. We can wish it all we want, but the truth is that the Falwells and the Robertsons and the Buchanans are not going to just fade away. They're out there in the public square, on the public airwaves. They're running stealth candidates in local elections, trying to take over school and library boards, town and county offices, even national party structures. In many states, and unless there are other gentler visions, for the human family being given voice, their divisive, mean-spirited, and often hateful message will be the only one heard. If we remove ourselves from the religious playing field by being too nice, too polite, or non-confrontational to even say what it is that we believe and why, then we will they will carry the day and have their way with both us and the world and that neither we nor humanity can afford. So let us be gentle, kind, respectful evangelists for that hopeful, inclusive human vision bequeathed to us by our universalist forebears. The stakes are too high for anything less. And I have to warn you, it's not enough to simply speak up about universalism with our lips we must further speak it with our lives, with the deeds and doings of our hearts and hands. We must, as the African-American saying goes, walk the walk and talk the talk. And let there be no illusions about it. Universalism is a tough and radical doctrine. It's a hard and demanding gospel, for it insists that we be constantly about the business of growing bigger and more inclusive and caring hearts. Setting aside our little fears and prejudices as we strive to care ever more widely for our brothers and sisters in the world. This is the demanding call of universalism. It's not a casual Sunday walk in the park. It's a tough doctrine of inclusion and care that constantly challenges us beyond the narrow confines of our natural selfishness and fear to ever wider circles of care and compassion. I pray that the days and years ahead, we who call ourselves Unitarian Universalists, 
will speak the generous, inclusive, affirming spirit of universalism. Speak it with our lips as we answer those who live by means and divisive little doctrines, and even more challenging, speak it with our lives. Amen and blessed be. Sunday we take some time to shine a light on what is held within our hearts and the cares and the joys that we hold in our community. And so I would invite you now, if you are online, to share in the chat any joys, concerns, sorrows, celebrations that you have. And for anyone in the sanctuary who would like to share that, I invite you now to come forward and light a candle. Please just line up on the side pick a paper up from there, light your candle, extinguish it in the water, and exit this way.
I lit our candle for Ukraine to acknowledge the suffering, the fear, the conflict that is happening there. And I lit one last candle for those heartfelt expressions that may just not be ready to share yet, but are held in this room and online. I will now invite you into a time of meditation. These words are by Sandra Fees. I invite you to pause for a moment to bring your full awareness to this sanctuary, this sacred space, to breathe, to remember to breathe. Often when we meditate, we close our eyes, but this morning, I invite you to keep your eyes open, to open your eyes, your ears, your hands, your heart. Notice the aliveness in your own body. Can you hear your own heart and your own breath? Can you feel it? Notice the aliveness of those around you and the aliveness of this sacred space. Let your senses be awakened here, open to color and shape, to sound and light, to music and breath, to the spirit of life that animates all things. This is a house of worship, our house of worship. We gather here to give worth and meaning to our lives, to honor the presence and mystery of the divine that greets us in our coming in and our going out, in our very being, in our being here. We who have come here today to this house of worship have brought our whole selves and all who we are in our exuberance and our worry, our grudges and our awakenings, our distractions and our callings, the storms and joys of being human. We have brought our dreams for this religious community and our passions for the values we cherish most. I invite you to bring your consciousness, your dreams to our house of worship for this community of love and care. What dreams do you bring? What blessings do you offer? What word of hope and inspiration do you carry? Let us take a moment of silence together. In the silence, allow a word or a phrase to come to your mind, a word of blessing, a word of hope, a word of intention.
May this sanctuary be blessed as a place of love and peace and open hearts. May it be so. Blessed be. Our next hymn is number 44. We sing of golden mornings. I invite you to rise as you are willing and able as we join in singing hymn number 44. like to invite Elaine forward to extinguish our chalice and Gerard to have our closing words. Closing words this morning are shine by Mary Edes. Like the cosmic dust following after the great Perseid meteor, we are the living remnants of time and all that has come to pass in its wake. Briefly shining lights on the way to eternity we are only visible to the naked eye for an instant. Take this moment to shine like the stardust that you are. May the light of our time on earth shine to bless the world and each other. Shine, shine, shine. Thank you to all our readers and service participants. I'd invite you to stay seated for a postlude by Coriolis, and then after that we will stand together and sing Carry the Flame. <laughs> 